Hi guys, we're getting ready to go on a road trip in the Robbie Con. This Jeep's a little bit special because this is my Jeep. This is the Jeep that really inspired me to put the LS in the JK back in 2009. And we'll talk more about that on the road. We have a single module system in this Jeep. Check it out, here's some single modules we'll be testing on the road trip. This Jeep has had the same L9H in it since the beginning. It's going on 90,000 miles. I think it's about 89,000 miles. We have our new battery tray in this. Canon filter with a sock. The L9H is a 2009. That's the year it came out. It's essentially the same engine as the L92, but they added flex fuel to it, so it has the taller injectors, which flow more. The harness is stock. And again, we are running the single module, so you can see we only have a GM computer here. Now this is a new prototype plug and play power distribution center. You can see the GM connector underneath and literally it just plugs in with no mods. Your air conditioning signals, brake signals, all sorts of stuff goes through that power distribution center and it's all plug and play. So my guys whipped up a little temporary cover for it. This is our new balance as you guys saw. And it really is about time that this Jeep got some fixing up because it's been uh, it's been flogged pretty hard over the years and it's never let me down. So we'll, uh, we're gonna hit the road with this thing and we'll talk more about it. We are on the very road that inspired the LSJK. I purchased this Jeep for my family back in 2009. We had a Toyota pickup, two door. I was always a Jeep guy, I've had a lot of Jeeps, but my Hilux pickup was perfect for my wife and I. It had two doors, Toyotas are really reliable. We were doing V8 swaps on the Toyota pickups back in the day, but we decided to have a, a child, so we needed a four-door. So we picked up this brand new Rubicon in California and hit the road with it. It had all stock tires and accessories. We, we didn't add anything to it. Got on this highway to go to New York, and it was pure misery. And when I say misery, my wife wanted to sell this Jeep as soon as we got back to Vegas. Merging on the highway, trying to keep up with traffic. We got pulled over in Park City for sudden speed changes or essentially going too slow. It was just misery. And my wife said that when we got back to Vegas, we were gonna sell the Jeep. But I liked the Jeep. It had live axles, full frame. It was a great off-roader vehicle. So I wanted to keep it. We were doing work with Hemis at the time and Autotech Performance, which was the mother company to Motec was working on Hemis. And while it was a giant improvement over the 3.8 V6, we weren't big fans of the transmission. Living in Las Vegas, some of our customers were overheating. You know the drill. So we decided to put an LS in. And I didn't want to start off with a full-blown Rubicon with all the options. So we ended up buying a 2008 JKU Sport, which had virtually no options on it. It did have a hard top. It had roll-up windows and it was a manual transmission. The results of that swap, the 5.3 LH6, which is the predecessor, well it's not the predecessor, it's basically an LC9 without the VVT. Uh, it worked out so well, it ran so good, that Jeep is still on the road today. That LS is pushing over 200,000 miles and still going strong. So this was the second vehicle that I did. This vehicle got a 2009 L9H because that's what was out at the time with a 6L80. And 2009 was somewhat of a unique year because seven and eight, the L92 was a great motor, but GM was still learning a lot, just like they are with, with the early LTs in 14, 15. And in nine, they really cleaned everything up. They pretty much standardized the hardware. They went to a different oil pressure sensor. They went to flex fuel with larger injectors. They changed the intake, but they still had a go-between operating system in 09. While the hardware was virtually identical to 10, they had unique controllers. If you have a 2009 engine and transmission, you want to stay with the 2009 ECM and TCM, which is exactly what this vehicle has. It has the 455 ECM. So we put in this 402 horsepower L9H 6.2 and everything changed. We took this same vehicle on the same trip up the 15 through Wyoming and Nebraska to New York, back down to Florida. And instead of being pure misery, we had a lot of fun. We could cruise at 80 miles an hour in windstorms. We could pass on the highway. My wife actually would drive the Jeep because she could accelerate and merge into traffic. It just was a completely and entirely different experience. Now back then we really weren't thinking about building a lot of swaps or doing a lot of swaps. 
but you build a better mouse trap and the, no the world knocks on your door, right? So that's kind of what happened and forced us into doing these engine conversions. I was content just doing this for myself. Here it is 10 years later, more than 10 years later, and I'm still content. I still love this Jeep. I'll never get rid of this Jeep. I'm not gonna put an LT in it. It's perfect the way it is. So let's talk a little bit how we did this a long time ago, over a decade ago, because, because as far as I know, Motif was the first one to integrate the LS into the JK and get the functionality that we wanted. Back then we did things very different. It was analog digital, which was a lot more work and a lot more complicated than the CAN interface that we have today. Uh, this vehicle does have the single module system and we're gonna talk about that. It's the final evolution of the conversion, which you really can't simplify it any more than that. So let's talk about um, this vehicle. It's an 09 JK Rubicon, deep water blue. And over the years, it just kind of became a parts running vehicle. My engineer used it as a test mule. He put about 8,000 miles on this thing, probing it, and trying different modules. And it just really kind of got run down. Uh, the shop was using it to run, to run parts back and forth to the drive shaft shop or whatever. So I decided it was time to clean it up. And my wife needs it up in Utah because it's been snowing quite a bit up there and the minivan doesn't doesn't quite make it. Uh, she couldn't even get into the driveway last week because we had about a foot of snow on the driveway. So, so I had to go up there and snow blow to get the, uh, the van into the garage. So that's why this Jeep's going to Utah so as it can deal with the, the environment up there. So we went from 35s to 37s and that's why the speedometer's off. As you can see, it's off about 15 miles an hour. Yeah, we're gonna track the mileage on this thing see what we get but let's talk about um, the known issues before we go further so one is the speedometer is off two you'll see that sway bar light is is flashing and that is uh, that is an interesting story because back when I did this Jeep we really didn't have the adapters available to us that that we have today so we used a 241 C that's a Chevy it's still a driver's side drop bolts right in but it didn't have the transfer case range sensor and I do believe there are some GM transfer cases with a range sensor built in. I don't know if they're compatible with the Chrysler uh, values, but this one didn't have it. So what I did was we took the range sensor from the Chrysler and we actually mounted it onto the four-wheel drive shifter down here. And it worked great. We made a little cam uh, setup. So as you move the shifter, the cam would push the plunger in and out and it works great. And it still works great, but it happens to be unplugged right now during the upgrades, and that's why that sway bar light is flashing, because it's not the sway bar module, it's also acting as a fault indicator for the transfer case range sensor. So we'll fix that. Our tire pressure monitor's on, and it's not because the tires are too low, it's because they're too high. Um, I checked them a little while ago, and they were about 38, 39 PSI. So we're gonna let that kind of run its course, because with the tires warming up and the heat the altitude they're going to change and we'll see where that goes other than that everything in this Jeep is functional you can see we're on cruise control right now and cruise control has more functionality than it does in a JK with our single module system this cruise control switch is a cruise control switch but it can also be used as a tap shift so you can shift the transmission through the cruise control switch. And I'm not gonna get into depth because there's several videos on it, but you don't lose your cruise control when you use that switch as a tap shift switch. The big deal in the single module, and this is probably the biggest difference between the single module and our V3 and V4 board, is the ESP button. Now watch when I turn it on and off. This vehicle has functional traction control. And no, it's not just the light coming on and off, it's got functional traction control. All the active braking functions work as intended. Anti-lock brakes, trailer sway control, brake assisted steering, you name it, it's all there. ABS. Everything is done over the CAN network now. The RPM signal, air conditioning, cruise control, tap shift, it's all processed through this CAN module. And essentially, we're just leaving everything alone. GM has it figured out. So, uh, like I said, the air conditioning, cruise control, tap shift, it's all working right through the GM system as GM intended it. We're not overlaying it, we're not patching it, we're not hacking it, we're not trying to put a GM into a hybrid situation where you're using a Chrysler transmission. It's just simply running exactly the way it was intended to by the manufacturer. And then it has this bi-directional bridge that we call our single module system that makes the two sides talk to each other so that we get the functionality that we want on the Jeep side. 
Now one of the advantages of this setup is that if the Chrysler side does go down, like you melt a tip them, uh, the GM side may continue to run, and I've had that happen. But I will say, back in the day when we were doing analog digital, we ran the fuel pump and starter circuits and all that directly th through the GM side. We hardwired it. We're not doing that anymore with a single module, so we are more reliant on the Chrysler side. So let's talk about what really inspired me to do this. I was on this highway. We were just going up these little grades like right here by Overton, Logandale. The engine was screaming with stock 32-inch tires. I'm trying to hold the speed limit at 75, and it's 80 up there, and these vehicles are just blowing by me. So my wife was asking why all these other vehicles, I mean, we're talking about Honda Civics and Toyota Priuses, are just blowing by me going 80, 90 miles an hour, and I'm floored. I got this thing to the floor, the engine's revving up, it's dropping down into third gear, it's dropping down into second gear, we're spinning up 5,000 RPM. I think I'm going to stick a leg out of bed, that's throw a rod. It was just miserable. The whole trip was like that. When we got into Wyoming, we had a 20, 30 uh, mile an hour headwind, and it was hard to keep 60, 60 miles an hour with the engine screaming. It, it just wasn't a very fun trip. I have a house now up in uh, Heber, Utah, which is right outside of Park City, and you guys know it gets a lot of snow up there, so you really need a four-wheel drive, and that's one of the reasons I drive this road so much, and my wife needs a uh, SUV with four-wheel drive to drive around in the snow up there. And I can tell you that making these trips up there now on this same road is is a dream. I can just sit back, set the cruise control at 80 in the 80 mile an hour zone and enjoy the ride. No drama, no engine screaming. It's just a completely different venue. So while we're up there near Park City, I think we were on the 80 freeway trying to crawl along at 60, 65 miles an hour. I had it set to cruise control and the transmission was upshifting and downshifting and upshifting and downshifting and my speed was changing. So I had a Dodge truck pull behind me not knowing it was a Utah Highway Patrol. And he pulled me over and he asked me why the sudden speed changes. Uh, he asked if I was tired. I said no. I have this thing set on cruise control at 70 miles an hour and it won't hold 70 miles an hour. So the cops advice to me was get a bigger engine next time. And that's exactly what I did. When we got back to Vegas, I decided I didn't want to sell this Jeep. I know that the live axles and the full frame is what I wanted. So if you look at your vehicle, you have lots of modules, dozens of modules. In this early JK, we have the Tipum or the Gateway module. We have the cab module, better known as the instrument cluster. We have the wireless module. We have the tire pressure monitoring system module. We have the sway bar control module, the SAS, that's the steering angle sensor. Of course, we have the PCM in this, which is the engine and the transmission controller. We got the occupant restraint module. We got all these modules. And a lot of you don't know that how complicated some of these newer vehicles are getting. This one module that we have added to the network and eliminate a couple other modules is, is really kind of the industry standard now. Everything can everything communicates over this controller area network or CAN system. The feds forced the CAN system in the mid-2000s to simplify the vehicles. Um, they forced OBD2 on us in about 1996, but what CAN did was there was a lot of redundancies, just like our early swap. Some vehicles had a coolant temp sensor for the dashboard for your gauge, and then a second coolant temp sensor for the engine control. So you had two sensors with three, four, sometimes five wires going around the vehicle. Well, what the Fed said was, why not just network those modules together and use the same sensor? And they did. So that means the ECM can have a coolant temp sensor and then that send that signal throughout the vehicle. That way every other module in the system has this information without being hardwired. The ABS system, the instrument cluster, everything knows what the coolant temp is. So it wasn't just the automotive industry going to CAN, but heavy equipment, ships, everything else went to it because it just simplifies everything. It simplifies the wiring. The key to it though is the coating. CAN system has to be robust. It has to be able to reject bad signals. It has to be able to pass priority signals. Some signals, like let's say ABS signals, need to be transmitted ultra fast, where other signals may be secondary, like your coolant temp. So the CAN system grew and grew, and what we've done is we've harnessed the power of that CAN system and have simply taken a GM engine, put it into a Chrysler vehicle, and as far as the Chrysler vehicle is concerned, it doesn't know if it's a GM engine or a Chrysler engine because it gets the CAN signals that it wants to see. All right, so enough of that technical stuff. Uh, you probably noticed that there's some parts missing off this Jeep, and that's because over the years, like I said, this Jeep has become our mule, and during builds, sometimes we need a part, and it's 
not readily available, so they would go to my Jeep and take the part off. The parts are pilfered, not filtered. Now back in my day, we had sayings. Pilfered means that you have the authority or the right to remove those parts, and that's why this vehicle has been pilfered. Filtering means you don't have the authority to remove those parts, so you're essentially stealing them. So no, these parts weren't stolen, these parts were removed. For instance, that compass module has been removed because we had a customer who had a compass module melt and he needed to get back on the road and the compass module is on the LIN network, that's the interior network, and a bunch of his dash stuff wasn't working so we took the compass module out of my Jeep. So we're going to head up to the Park City, Utah area and stay tuned because we got a lot of, a lot of cool stuff coming up guys.